ask this about people about their work life. Some will say they've been there. When I ask them about your personal life, most of us don't want to be there on this long stretch, but have you ever had a night when you have worked like a dog all day long, you go home, the traffic has been lousy, and you walk in the door, and you are nothing but bitter, bitching, and moaning? It can happen. And frankly, it can happen with any of us, I think, in a moment of doing our practice, too. We're human. And how do we recover from those moments? The next level up she talks about is biostatic. These are life restraining, where we remain blind to the other's plight and neglect them as a nuisance. Think about those days when we are completely understaffed, more stuff going on, more tasks to be accomplished, little time to relate. And then you think about that someone who needs that glass of water, needs that help to the restroom, is hungry, wants something to eat, and we can't do it. And then think about what it feels like to ourselves when we know at the end of the day that we did not get the glass of water, that we weren't there to help somebody get to where they needed to be. This is when I begin to say to you, we need to be thinking about how do we then become a proactive part of making our system say, this is no longer acceptable, we've got to change it. Biopassive. Oops, life neutral, detached, passive, disengaged. Oh, I think about this as when I go to 7-Eleven and I buy something real quick because I forgot milk and it's now 6 o'clock and I need to get it home and get it done. And I walk in and I have a totally biopassive relationship with the person at the cash register. How many days in our work do we experience totally biopassive moments in our work life? And if you take any one of these and say, how do I at least kick it up a notch and make it that much better? Bioactive. These are relationships that are life-sustaining, concerned, compassionate, and competent. Again, I invite you to think about your home life. How many evenings do you have where you really do sit around the table, enjoy dinner, ask each other how the day has been, you might even end dinner with a cup of coffee, the dog jumps up on your lap, and you just get to be together and have a few minutes to talk. And you wind down, and it's good. To me, that's the bioactive night. It's good. You've just, if it's five minutes, you've had some time together. But then there's the last and the great, the biogenic, the life-giving moments that we get to be a part of. In our work as nurses, we get to do this. We get to be those moments with another human being where we can foster spiritual freedom for each other, where healing flows freely. Something magic happens, and we're awake enough and alert enough to see it. It's much like the Thanksgiving dinner when the statement was made, what do you see around you? You see a woman's touch. I think in our work in healthcare and in healing, there are so many times that we can look up and see life-giving moments around us if we would just stop and notice them. We all have those moments in healthcare where we can um, go down the hall, you see the need, you realize right now this patient is ready. Do you work in an environment where you can step outside the door and say to your colleagues, could you give me 5, 10, 15 minutes because I need to be alone? Do you have your work group set up such that you're not just the nurse, but you have the nursing assistant, you have a work team where you can deploy the team so that you, the nurse, can go and do what it is that you are most meant to do? Do you have the work where you, the administrator, can take the time to be with somebody who really needs you right now to know that they're capable of doing the job they have? So if you start to think about yourself as a work unit, how do we create the opportunity that when a biogenic second comes along, you can turn it into a 10 minute, a 20 minute? You can turn it into a moment. When I work with the nurses at Virginia Mason, after two days of retreating, we oftentimes come to this conversation, we want more biogenic moments in our life. So we always end the retreat with a commitment to, what are you going to do? Everybody goes back to their own work unit, and they make commitments about what they're going to do. At first, we hoped it was going to be great things they were going to do for patients, but what did we discover? 
the first few groups that went through, it was great things they were going to do about themselves. They recognize that they do for their patients all the time. They care for their patients, but they don't take the time to sustain and care for each other. So now if you go to Virginia Mason, you'll see things like the bathrooms have clouds painted on them because they knew that was a space you could meditate and be alone. You'll see stains and paintings and brag boards all over the place. They committed to having daily huddles, and in this huddle that would happen at 11 a.m., everybody was supposed to come to it and say what their needs were. How are they doing? What are their needs? Who needs some help so we can exchange? They realized that nobody after three months, and this is on three different units, ever asked for help. We don't do that. So what did they do? They turned it around. If you don't come to huddle, they will now go down the hall and find you and see what kind of help you need. I thought that was a beautiful way of staying with the commitment, but recognizing we're not so likely. If we figure we can get the time to come to the huddle, maybe we don't think we have the right to ask. But if we go find each other, it's quite a way they have of making their work unit somewhere between that level three and that level one on a regular basis. Meg Wheatley always impresses me with her wisdom. She says, the essential truth I'm discovering right now is that when we are together, more becomes possible. When we are together, joy is available. In the midst of a world that is insane, that will continue to surprise us with new outrages, in the midst of that future, the gift we have is each other. How do we hold each other up? Well, not surprisingly, I would say caring, caring, caring. <laughs> so the um, last group that I, readings that I want to talk to you about is Brene Brown's work. Are any of you familiar with Brene Brown? I, I encourage you to take a look at her. She's from Houston, Texas, and has done a tremendous amount of grounded theory work on how do people make their way in this world. And some of the pieces that I've really resonated with reading recently was, for me, I saw a caring connection, courage connection, and compassion connection. So I'm going to share from you a few words from her. This is connection. Connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. When they give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. These are the relationships that are worth holding on to. These are the ones that, when you're with them, you can show up with all your vulnerabilities, but they're there to help you lift up. Courage. Courage is about speaking honestly and openly about who we are, about what we're feeling, and about our experiences. Heroics is about putting our life on the line. Courage is about putting our vulnerabilities on the line. You know, when you're ready to put your vulnerabilities on the line, it means you're willing to take a risk and you're willing to be wrong. And when we're willing to be wrong, it's amazing how much further we can go. Um, you know, the beauty about going back to school, when I watch our students come back for their graduate degrees, they've been such good RNs, and now they're coming back to be an advanced practice nurse. And you see them just wobbling in the um, no longer being an expert. They're new to doing what they're doing. When you watch someone like me become a dean, you're suddenly wobbling in your noviceness. But you know, to not be willing to walk into that wobbly noviceness, you're never going to stretch and be the next person you're meant to be. And I would venture to guess that anybody that has gone into that nervousness and stretching and been courageous enough to show up and be willing to be wrong with all your vulnerabilities, isn't that when life gets better? Isn't that when you find that you learned even deeper what you're capable of? And to me, that's what courage is all about. It's being willing to step up, take a risk, trust that you are exactly where you're meant to be at this point in time, and go for it. I love this statement from Helen Keller. One can never consent to creep when one feels an impulse to soar. Compassion. 
Compassion practice is daring. It involves learning to relax and move gently toward that which scares us. It's not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. How awesome the time that you really come to grapple with that statement, there but by the grace of God goes I. First time you really, truly, deeply hold that and own it, it sure makes judgment jump right out the window. You can't hold judgment and that statement, there but by the grace of God go I, all in the same space. To see our shared humanity, why this was your plight and why this is mine, who knows? But here we are together. This is at Virginia Mason. This is one of the things that they did after one of our retreats. This is the ceiling. Virginia Mason is a very old hospital with very long corridors, and they wanted a message to be there when anybody enjoying their space. So imagine yourself being a new nurse and going to work on this unit, and you see hanging from the ceiling these words. Imagine your patient being on a gurney, and you're rolling down on your back, and you're looking up, and you're seeing compassion, calm, competence. Imagine being a family member, knowing that your beloved is taken care of on this unit. And you see, this is what they say we are, and this is how we wish to be. I thought that was an incredibly creative way to welcome people into the setting they wanted to be. So, I end with a thank you. This is a picture of my son's organic orchard in Washington State. And in the statement I leave it with, there are three, there are in the end three things that last. Faith, hope, and love. And of course, the greatest of these is love. Thank you. Did I overstay my welcome, or is there time for questions? What comments? Yes. I'm a nurse in Alaska. And there's one thing that rings true for me that I can always, I can get so flustered and mad at the doctor who gave the patient, my home health patient, the wrong med in the hospital and interchanged some BP meds or whatever. And I just always calmly think it's with my intention that the healing is going to take place. And it's with your action that you will connect respectfully and graciously with a physician who made the decision that they made with the best amount of information and time and space that they had. And we own as a healthcare team that we took the handoff. And thank goodness, as part of the team, you were there to see how you can help on the other side, back in the acute care setting, that we can make sure we offer the both care, best care on both sides. Thanks for sharing that. Hi, Dr. Swanson. My name is Connie Bash, and I'm a student here at the U of M. Um, I just wanted to say that in the spring semester, um, for one of our nursing theory classes, my group chose your theory of caring as one of our projects. And um, I just wanted to say how awesome I think your presentation was, and Thank I could you. resonate with every single thing you said. Um, I've studied a lot of nursing theories and you know in my um, undergrad and graduate careers and I think yours so far has really resonated with current nursing practice Thanks. and it's really just a comment and really a question but um, I would really look forward to seeing that theory of caring being much more embedded into at least BSN nursing practice or even grad practice and being celebrated and emphasized a lot because I think you really captured um, the heart of what we do so thank, thank you, you. Thanks. 
That um, means a lot to me, especially coming from you, because I thought you were one of the most awesome speakers I ever heard this morning. So thank you very much. Marie. Kristen, hi. Hi, I'm Manthe. Um, I, I, I just want to second what Connie said. Uh, in my history of my career, many people know I, we started primary nursing here at the U of M on a unit in, 19, in 1968 on Station 32. And for years and years and years and years, people said, what is your nursing theory? I'm sorry. What is your nursing theory? And I, you know, I, well, it's not based on a nursing theory. It's a da 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 As we evolved and as this work grew and we began to expand into relationship-based care, as you know, mm -hmm. we have adopted your theory, and that is the theoretical framework that's used in the relationship-based care book and in the relationship-based care delivery in hospitals. And so I want to second what Connie said. It is a wonderful theory, and we've been so happy to have adopted it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You know, I, I have to be honest and say I never set out to be a nurse theorist. Those people are old and they're decrepit. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to be able to answer 32 questions about the usefulness of their work. That had never, ever been my intention. Truly, I didn't even want to do caring. But Jean Watson, as my chair, said, if you're going to study with me and you want to know what it's like for women to miscarry, then you're going to have to ask them what caring means. So I was like 27 years old. And if your dissertation chair says, if you're going to study with me, you better ask about caring, what do you think is the right answer? <laughs> so I asked about caring. And I interviewed 17 of the 20 women that I was going to interview. And I went back and I told Jean about my findings about miscarriage. Oh, the tears were coming down her cheeks as she listened to the stories about what it was like to miscarry. And then she says, OK, tell me what you learned about caring. And I told her what I had learned so far, and she, honest to God, looked like she had eaten something that didn't agree with her. I knew I wasn't there yet. <laughs> it was not a good feeling, knowing I only had about three more people out of my intended 20 that I was going to interview. So I'll never forget the next day going to interview this woman who had a stillborn in the past. She had the miscarriage recently that brought her into my study. And she also had a two-year-old. So here I am with my tape recorder. The two-year-old's running all over. The mother's running all over. I'm running all over. We went out to the swing, and she's swinging the child. I'm with my tape recorder because I don't want to listen a word of what this woman is saying. It went on for two and a half hours. And I said to her, OK, before I leave, let me look. I reached in my briefcase, and I said, oh, darn, I forgot to ask you one question. Can you tell me some things that people said or did that made you feel cared for or cared about. She looked at me and said, you know, I almost refused to be in your study when you called and said you were going to also ask me about caring because uh, I don't know what to tell you. OK, remember I told you how desperate I was? So you know when the light bulb goes off? At that moment, I switched the question and I said, if you can't tell me what they said or did, can you tell me the message and how they treated you? And she said, that one is much easier. The worst thing you can get is to not have somebody understand just how much it hurts. And after listening to, at that point, it would be 18 stories of pregnancy loss, I never cried. But that one statement, I knew the divine wisdom in what she was saying. The worst thing you can get is to not have somebody understand just how much it hurts. And it was after that that I began to understand what caring meant. It's people want us to know what it's like for them. Then I spent um, a year and a half hanging out in the newborn intensive care unit at University of Washington Medical Center as my postdoc interviewing mom, dad, physician, and nurse about what it was like to provide care to vulnerable infants. And it was through that year and a half of hanging out that I began to get the sense of not just from the parents who were the receivers of care, but I also began to get the sense of from the parents who were the givers of care. And I began to see from the perspective of the physician and the nurse who were both the givers of care. And as the chief medical officer said to me, 
You know, if you don't show up here without your curiosity and your willingness to learn, because I've been in this business for 40 years and not a day goes by that I see something I've never known before. So he taught me about you show up with your vulnerabilities and your willingness to learn. And through that study, I took caring from the eyes of women who miscarried now to the eyes of four major care providers, mom, dad, physician, and nurse, because we all had in common caring for that very vulnerable infant. So the work began to grow from listening intently and deeply to what people described when they described doing their work in a way that mattered. Quick thing I learned from the newborn intensive care unit study. Imagine yourself a juggler with four major balls up in the air. Ball number one is called caring, just like I described it to you. Whether you're a mom, a dad, a physician, or nurse, your desire to know, be with, do for, enable, and maintain belief in the baby and everybody in the whole unit. Then the next ball you keep up in the air is attachments. All those attachments that come in and out of your life in the course of the day in that unit. All the other mothers who are out in the waiting room crying, all of the fathers who come flying in the door at 6 p.m. after they've worked all day long, the physicians that, oh, by the way, have rotated now every four weeks. They're in there scared to death because now they're responsible for 13 incredibly ill babies. And when they come in the next morning and they're asked to make an account of everything they did right, anything they did wrong, they're never asked what does it feel like to be responsible for all those sick babies. So you have all these attachments, all these relationships you've got to manage, plus the caring ball. Now imagine all the responsibilities that you've got to manage, whether you're the dad that's making sure that there's enough money that will allow you, oh, and by the way, to take care of those other kids at home while she gets to be there and pump the milk to be with the baby, whether you are the uh, neonatologist who knows now that this family is begging you, expecting you, please save my baby's life, whether you are the neonatal intensive care unit nurse who knows that you actually wasted two precious drops of that mother's milk because you weren't able to get there soon enough to put it in the refrigerator, whether you're the mother that's been pumping the milk, all these responsibilities, plus society saying to that hospital, save those babies. I don't care that they were born on the edge of viability. So you start to think of caring, attaching, managing responsibilities. And then the last ball that I saw that would constantly be up in the air was called avoiding bad outcomes. How do you keep things from going wrong that shouldn't have gone wrong? The physicians and the nurses all said to me, a bad outcome isn't a baby dying in the newborn intensive care unit. Some babies are meant to die. This is the length of their life. A bad outcome is when a baby dies that shouldn't have died. A bad outcome is when the breast milk has to be wasted because we, didn't, we were too overworked to get there in time. A bad outcome is when a mother needs somebody to help her put her baby to breast, but we don't have time for it. So they began to tell me that there are four balls we keep up in the air in a complex context. Caring, attaching, managing responsibility, avoiding bad outcomes. And I interviewed the mom, the dad, the physician, and the nurse of five separate babies. And each one of them told me the complete story about what it was like to care for that baby. And each person's story was different than the other three people I interviewed. And it hit me that caring in a complex context includes caring, attaching, managing responsibility, and avoiding bad outcomes. And this is what we're trying to juggle any one of our work days. A perinatologist, a resident, I came and I presented this one day, and first of all, they thought this is some of the strangest research they've ever heard, but once they listened to it long enough, this young man raises his hand and he said, you know, that caring and attaching part, that's what brought me into pediatric medicine. I wanted to be able to form relationships with my families. That's what brought me there. But when I work a night shift, managing responsibilities and avoiding bad outcomes. And the morning comes and I have to report everything I kept from going wrong, every chore and task I got done. And I walk back exhausted. It's not until about three the next morning that I wake up in the middle of the night and my heart is breaking for the caring and attaching I never got to do. So I put before you that maybe keeping that, managing responsibilities and avoiding bad outcomes as the only two balls we're ever juggling 
And if that becomes our whole work, the caring and attaching disappears and we burn out. That's not what we came here for. And so when you think about how do you make your units work right, create a place where all four of those walls, which must be balanced, they all must do. It's part of the work. How do we attend to the caring and attaching sides of our work at the same time we attend to the managing responsibility and avoiding bad outcomes? Long answer about the theory. You got me talking. <laughs> Okay, I know that you're ready to take us away. So thank you all so very much. Are you already wired? Yeah, it's fine. Um, uh, Kristen, that was just outstanding. And I think you embody all of the speakers that we've had today who have really, we can tell, really stretched and developed something uh, very profound and really stretching somewhat for the speakers and certainly the sages. I, many of the sages said this was the most difficult thing they've ever done. Easy to give a speech of two hours, but to come up and give uh, several minutes. So I just want to thank all of the speakers. You were excellent to really stretch and help us learn and grow and look at things differently than we ever have before. And um, so I want to thank you in particular, but to all the speakers, could we please just thank all the speakers and the sages. And <laughs> outstanding. Impromptu, and the impromptu speakers, uh, Cindy, still here? Cindy Traxler? Is she able to still be here? She was outstanding too. Um, uh, we were going to do some reflections, but I just feel to follow that uh, would be very difficult. Uh, so we will have more reflection tomorrow. Uh, Margo had said, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to wrap up. Well, not quite, because we are hoping that after you run to the bathroom, Check your emails, make a quick phone call, do whatever you have to do that you will stay and join us for something, again, new, a little different, uh, risk-taking perhaps, but what we have called for this year the Joyful Jam. And I don't know if you noticed the music that was playing when we came in here at break. It's some of our faculty members' favorite music, but instead of listening to a CD, we are going to be entertained, if not immediately, very shortly by the Cafe Accordion Orchestra. And so I'd like to uh, ask Sue Sennelbach to come up here and invite you all to stay and continue some biogenic, love that whole concept, I will, we will hear about this tomorrow too, biogenic collaboration uh, and some uh, refreshments, heavy duty refreshments and some uh, cash bar and then the music. So Sue. Hi, my name is Sue Sindelbach, and I'm the current pre Zeta chapter president of Sigma Theta Tau International. And we were so excited that Joanne asked us if we could speak about an hour of what Zeta chapter is doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Oh, <laughs> I just want to give you, Zeta was started in 1922 uh, by the University of Indiana by six nurses, and the Zeta chapter words mean storge, tharos, and time, meaning love, courage, and honor. And as we learned this morning, the word, uh, Greek word for joy means grace, a gift that is freely given. So on behalf of Zeta, we welcome you and thank you for attending today and enjoy this evening.